and we'll see if his name or anyone else pops in, but I don't, okay. I don't think it's going to work. Can you check again, please? Oh, we have one attendee. Hello. I think it is working. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So let's uh, get it. Yeah. Technology. Alrighty. And also let's, um, before we officially begin, why don't you just try to share your screen and make sure you're able to do all that and then we'll. You have to enable a uh, screen sharing. Yeah, actually what I have to do is make you a um, co-host. Okay, you should be able to now. Welcome everyone, just stand by. We're just um, fixing some issues here, some technical difficulties, but we're almost ready to go. Okay, excellent. I can see. Yeah, can you see it? Yep. I yep. Agree. I see it. Perfect. Great. And my husband is, is seeing it already, so it's it's on. Oh, excellent. Okay, so let's Great. get started. Oof. Let, <laughs> let... <laughs> I don't know that. That was, oh, uh, that was a little confusing. Okay. Uh, welcome, greetings, people of the internet. Thank you so much for putting up with uh, our um, delay here. Uh, welcome to the second installment of the fall 2023 Sarah Little Turnbull Foundation Lecture Series here at um, Lehman College, virtually, of course. Our ongoing exploration of the gaze continues with a particular focus on the subversion of the traditional male gaze by the powerful emergence of the female gaze. And um, <clears throat> actually, before we get into it, I should have mentioned this last week, slipped my mind, but uh, I think it's essential to recognize that this month, October, is also Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, and beyond just being aware of the disease itself, it's important to really reflect that on, on the women and sometimes men uh, who actually are diagnosed with this disease and have to bear the weight of it. And uh, I think if we're talking about the gays, it's important to recognize that um, we often overlook the people that have to deal with this. Uh, we have to resist the urge to represent breast cancer patients through their disease. Uh, or employ what Michel Foucault called the medical gaze. We kind of talked about Foucault last week, um, but it's very much in keeping with our discussions about perception and representation, and that's why I wanted to mention it. Uh, and I just urge everyone to reach out to a, a breast cancer charity. Hold on, my dog is walking. Um, and some kind of don uh, charity that you trust, and please donate. I'm just going to put in to the chat, a couple of um, a few different um, really good charities um, and awareness uh, research foundations that deal with this. Uh, American Cancer Society, for one, Breast Cancer Research Foundation, Susan G. Komen Foundation, et cetera. So, um, okay. So, oh, hold on just one second. Oh. Sorry about that. All right. Now it is um, with that, it's my honor to introduce our distinguished guest for today, the uh, artist and activist, Andrea Arroyo. Uh, Andrea is an award-winning artist known for her exceptional work in various media, uh, from drawing and painting to public art and site-specific installations. Her art has not only graced international exhibitions, but it's also left an indelible mark on our public spaces, including New York City uh, public schools and even a subway station that uh, is very close to Lehman College as it happens. Um, Andrea's numerous accolades include recognition from the New York Foundation for the Arts, the Clinton Global Initiative, <clears throat> excuse me, and the United Nations. Her artistry has received critical support from institutions like the Puffin Foundation, the Harlem Arts Alliance, and the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, underscoring her remarkable contributions to the in the world of art. Um, also, she's a curator, a passionate advocate for culture, and a sought-after speaker and lecturer, so we're really lucky to have her. Her work has been published extensively. Her, her resume is a little scary. Uh, <laughs> I was looking over it, by the way. I was like really doing a deep dive. It's pretty impressive. Um, and uh, she's even been in, in the cover of The New Yorker. She works for The Nation, which is actually how I found out about her way back when I started reading The Nation. Um, when I was, you know, in my early 20s. Her art serves the powerful representation of the female gaze, making her the perfect guest to, to continue this discussion. So without further ado, let's welcome Andrea Arroyo to share her insights and her experience uh, with the female gaze and its transformative power. Thanks so much for uh, joining with, with us today, uh, Andrea, and for 
wading through the technical issues. I really appreciate it. Welcome. Thank you so much, David, and thank you everybody for joining us. And apologies for the tech difficulties, but you know, technology is uh, temperamental sometimes. So thank you so much. I am uh, honored to be here with you, and uh, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna go through. I do a lot of work in different kinds of uh, media, so I'm gonna go through a lot of. Uh, images so to give you a sense of, of what I do and uh, just you know talking through them uh, so I thought I'll start with the uh, oops with this image which uh, is uh it's uh, the subway station actually near uh, Lehman College so this is titled I'm sorry I'm, I'm just gonna hide my stuff this is just not uh, working the way it's supposed to work but uh, anyways is that okay? Is that better? Yeah, I, I can see it. And I, I recognize this uh, piece. I've seen it like many times, never knowing that you worked on it. So this is kind of cool. Thank you. So uh, this piece is titled My Son, Mi Sol, both in English and Spanish. And it was commissioned by the MTA, uh, Arts for Transit. And uh, it's a public art project. It's uh, permanently installed on the platforms of the Gun Hill Road Station. Um, and uh, it deals with themes of uh, basically what I wanted to portray was harmony, uh, diversity, you know, people's diversity, harmony with the environment, with nature. I think a lot about nature in the urban environments because we live in New York City and green spaces are uh, beautiful and needed and sometimes in some neighborhoods not easy to find. So uh, this was kind of a uh, celebration of nature within the urban uh, uh, landscape. Uh, this is part of it's a detail. So it's uh, 15 uh, different uh, faceted glass panels. And uh, this is just a few of them. And I love visiting the station sometimes and just uh, looking at how people react to the to the piece and how they interact is just very sweet. And also very sweet to know that the piece is there permanently. So um, that's, you know, I'm very proud of honor and honor to be uh, the oh. artist doing this. Also, one little anecdote about this. I'm not entirely sure about this one. I'm pretty sure that a Lehman student, uh, a graduate of Lehman from years ago, actually helped install this piece because he works for the MTA. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I have to confirm that. But one of our yeah. former students does do that and has done that, for especially in the Bronx. I'm pretty right. sure this is one of them, but uh, yes, it's lovely regardless. Thank you. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, these projects are super exciting for both the artists mm -hmm. and I, I believe the community as well. So sure, of course. Great. Yeah. Um, so next, I'm going to show you a few uh, images from a series that I titled um, a Women, a Sacred Women, and it's inspired by women from history and mythology and also by uh, sacred architecture. So things like cathedrals and temples and pyramids. This is titled Susanna and the Elders, and it's mixed media on panel, and it's approximately 30 by 40. And uh, it's again one of the stories from uh, mythology, this, uh, from the Old Testament. And uh, you can see a woman with, uh, you know, men's eyes just gazing at her. It's a story of of, uh, of the Bible. So it's uh, just look it up. It's interesting. Um, this one is uh, titled Sochiketzal and is the Aztec goddess of uh, fertility and abundance. Again, is uh, from the same series, inspired by uh, the panels are, are inspired by architecture that is uh, sacred, you know, cathedrals, churches, pyramids, uh, mausoleums, things like that. Um, you know, I, I celebrate women and the, the female form in these pieces. Um, this is Miriam and the, and the Red Sea from the same uh, series. And then the next one, speaking of goddesses, uh, this is my uh, most recent uh, exhibition. It's uh, titled Goddesses at the Palace, and it was presented at the United Palace. Um, it's part of my fellowship with Creatives Rebuild New York, and uh, it's 14 feet high by approximately 50 feet long, and it's mixed media and uh, integrated with the architectural features of the United Palace. Uh, the next slide shows you, oops, went the wrong way. Uh, this is how the full piece uh, looked. It's a uh, Tyvek cut paper and drawing. 
and is integrated with these uh, beautiful, super Baroque architectural features. And I really like how the place, the place uh, looked in the space. It's floating uh, uh, below the balcony and it's floating so in a way that when people walk by, it moves. So I feel like the, the goddesses are kind of dancing and they come alive. It's also got paper on Tyvek. So, gosh, I'm going backwards. Okay, sorry about that. So this one is a different piece. It's uh, titled Covida, homage to the victims of the pandemic. And it was commissioned by the Morris Jumel Mansion Museum during the height of the pandemic. The museum was closed, of course. And uh, they commissioned this piece because they, they wanted to have something outside and some kind of a piece that either commemorated or you know created a safe space. So I created this and installed it on the on the gates of the mansion. And uh, we created uh, different programming uh, so that people could gather outside, of course, wearing masks. And uh, we had a few events. Um, the ribbons that you see on the sides of the piece were just the, the beginning. Uh, this is, these are probably a hundred ribbons with names of uh, victims and people who died died of COVID. Uh, through uh, through the um, the run of the show, people were invited to submit names or to come to the mansion and write names on the ribbons. So it became this amazing collection of ribbons, probably over 500 of them, uh, with names that were written by me or by volunteers or, or by visitors that came into the museum and just wanted to participate. Um, this is a detail of the of the piece. Are those marigolds on the top? Is it... they, yes, they are marigolds. Okay. So uh, the piece is also inspired by Dia de los Muertos, the other day. Okay, tradition, I was going uh, yeah, to say. In Mexico. Mm -hmm. and, okay. uh, and also in the traditions of, you know, altar making and, you know, Southeast Asia, India, it's kind of a similar traditions. Uh, this one is, is a piece also commissioned by the Morris Rumel Mansion Museum for one of my solo shows there. And it's titled Eliza's Home. And uh, it's a uh, repurposed vinyl and uh, an acrylic paint, and it's integrated with the original balcony of the mansion. So I really wanted to celebrate Eliza Jumel, who was the last owner of the house. And, uh, and also thinking of where the house is located. So this is in Washington Heights. And uh, thinking of you know, how we are all standing on the traditional land of the Lenape. And the thinking of the women who inhabited these spaces, right? So thinking of the Lenape women and then going through colonial times, the Harlem Renaissance, and then all the way to who we are now, you know, women like myself who are immigrants who come to this neighborhood and just make New York what it is today. So just thinking of connecting those stories um, and celebrating just the, the female energy. Um, this is a different piece, it's actually on view on Fifth Avenue and 112. And this was commissioned by Art Bridge and it's titled Nurture Nature. And it's 400 uh, feet. Uh, and it's uh, imagery that has to do with the nature, the environment, immigration, community. So it has a lot of images that are very uplifting, very uh, colors are very vibrant. I really wanted to bring some life to these uh, places that sometimes are very monochromatic. And uh, it, it's been there for uh, around a year. And uh, it, it was just a wonderful uh, commission. I, I got together with the community, created some workshops so that we could talk about what was important to them and what was important for them to, um, to have in their, in their living uh, environment. This one is uh, titled Women of the Forest. And uh, I'm there just you know, to think about uh, scale. And you know, I saw this beautiful uh, wall of ivy in East Harlem in, in a garden. I just fell in love with it. So I made some inquiries and found out that the New York Restoration Project uh, was managing the garden. So I uh, partnered with them and they commissioned the piece and again, thinking of how we as human beings interact with nature, uh, I am also very mindful when I do these kinds of installations to be uh, doing things that are not impacting the plants. 
Um, that's very, very important to me. And I also love doing work and creating art in places that are unexpected. I love to see the reaction of people that, when they walk by and suddenly see this, you know, a bunch of women floating or flying uh, in between the ivy. So, you know, I love doing these kinds of things. Um, the, the wall of ivy is not there anymore, unfortunately. So I'm glad I have some documentation of that. So the, you mentioned before uh, that these are on, on a, in, there are a few slides back that they're on Tyvek, which is like yes. a, a, is that also, like, are all these outdoor pieces also on Tyvek? No, there are different materials and uh, many of them come from materials from, from the arts. So mm -hmm. some of them, I actually don't have the specifics of, of what they are. I do know that they're a vinyl mesh and I'm pretty sure okay. they're used for a, uh, outdoor either gardening uh, features for uh, building outdoor you know facades things like that they're flexible uh, yeah and they're very weather resistant so i work okay, I I, love working on them yes i was going to ask about that all right so material for arts is like the not-for-profit that has a huge back uh, like they have a huge uh, warehouse i think in long island city and they, do, they have all yes. kinds of they all have all kinds of stuff that's, that artists can use. And actually, Lehman just, this is for the students. The Lehman has just uh, partnered with them. So in the spring, we can, you know, we could bring students there. So it's actually like a huge, amazing resource. Um, it's which, incredible. I recommend yeah. everyone going to Materials for the Arts and going in with a very open mind. Yeah. Because, you know, the materials are not necessarily art supplies, but they're just different kinds of things. And uh, yeah. every time I go, there is an adventure in, in creativity and imagination. And you find yeah. like, stuff that, you know, you cannot even imagine what to do with. And then suddenly you get an idea. So it's, it's like, inspiring. Yeah, it's inspiring. Yeah, very for sure. inspiring. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so this is titled Lilith, and it was installed in uh, Sherman Creek Park. Um was also one of my first uh, public art in, in you know, natural environment. Uh, this one is titled Maggie's Wisdom, and it's uh, it, it was in Maggie's Garden in Harlem, again, commissioned by New York Restoration Project. And it's uh, a, a different kind of a vinyl mesh, but similar to what was I do, um, using before. Um, and again, I love you know creating these these kinds of works, installing them, and then you see the reaction of the community. Uh, it's it's really really sweet. It's usually is extremely positive, and uh, and also trying to I I see this as almost as as collaborations with the trees. So I find this a magnolia tree or an ivy wall, and uh, I just I think I talk to the to the trees and to the plants and just you know ask them to collaborate with me, and it's just a very sweet process. So and that's you know in my own head, but that's the way I I work. Um, this one is titled Viva la Vida, and it was commissioned by the New York Botanical Garden uh, for the Frida Kahlo Art Garden Life Exhibition. So that was a blockbuster, as they call it, exhibition. They received like you know thousands and thousands of visitors. They commissioned this piece uh, to celebrate Dia de Muertos, and um, uh, I integrated both traditional elements from the Day of the Dead and also contemporary elements. And the plants are both local plants and the plants that Frida Kahlo had in her garden. So it, it was a very uh, interesting project. Also, during the run of the show, it was very, very sweet to see the community interacting with the piece. It is uh, it is an altar, or it's perceived as an altar. So many people came in uh, Dia de Muertos and brought photographs of loved ones and flowers and just mementos to to share and to celebrate uh, Dia de Muertos, Day of the Dead. So that was you know, really great. Um, this one is the title Pearls of Wisdom, and uh, it was commissioned by the Elizabeth Cady Stanton Museum in Seneca Falls. And uh, it's uh, mixed media with pearls and integrated with this historic bed frame. So when I was invited to have this show at the museum, uh, I was super excited. This is this was the house where she lived and uh, where they had a lot of the meetings um, to work uh, for to get the votes for women in New York. So uh, these were this is actually the bedroom, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's bedroom, and uh, it has original floors. So again, it's collaborating with you know things and inanimate objects. 
in a way that I think, um, you know, integrating contemporary art and integrating the stories and thinking how we relate to the past and how we uh, link you know, past to present and how the struggles and the victories of women of that era relate to our own struggles. I think it's it's also notable that um, it's a bed, and usually in in art historical settings, a bed has a woman on it, you know, prostrate and often nude. And yes. here you're like you kind of like you're under the bed, like draped on the floor. It's it's not an overt reference to a woman's body. Like it's you you've already shown like strategies about how to subvert the male gaze and i think that right. one's like kind of real it's, it's it's on the nose that one that particular mm -hmm. one as this, is this one, one is uh, it's, a, it's a, again a working with the uh, historic uh, his object so this is a historical good creed that was in the museum and uh, it was in the children's room in the in the house and again thinking of how you know, women and everything females relates in general or is perceived as related to childhood or childbearing. And uh, I wanted to think about this in a different way and I just give a sense of how women, you know, bear children and nurture children, but, and, you know, they were children at one point, of course, uh, but also about our lives beyond that you know, and, and uh, so much more than that. So this is uh, also thinking of how we as women need nurturing ourselves, right? So, yeah. Um, this one is titled Daphne and is mixed media on lace, on vintage lace. And uh, it, this is uh, this was for my solo exhibit at the Malcolm X and Betty Shabazz Center in Harlem, Washington Heights actually. Uh, this was the place of um, the assassination of Malcolm X, and uh, these are the original architectural features. And again, I, I go into these space and, uh, spaces and I want to honor the spaces and integrate the work rather than display my work. So that's something that's very important to me, to honor the spaces and what they mean and the history of the place. So this is just uh, a very simple, you know, line drawing on lace that evokes some of the imagery of the you know the rosettes and the the um, the figures and the in the architecture and also thinking of uh, the female energy in that place so yeah that's also interesting um this is a project that i uh, created is flor de tierra flower of the earth homage to the women of juarez uh, some people might be familiar with the case of the women who have been uh, killed and disappeared in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. Uh, basically, in the 90s, thousands of women were disappeared, like quote unquote, disappeared um, after the um, maquiladoras from the US and other countries set shop in Mexico in the border towns. Uh, and the, the, basically the towns were not big enough to the inf to, for the influx of uh, immigrant women from southern Mexico who came um, to the maquiladoras to work, and it became a really unsafe uh, area. Um, so there was no, you know, some of the places had no electricity, the maquiladoras, the, the, these factories had 24-hour uh, uh, 24 hours a day work shifts, so women work, you know, day and night, and they had, you know, transportation that was extremely unsafe, and they started to be forcibly disappeared, and nobody was doing anything about it, and, uh, and I don't, I think to date nobody has been actually uh, jailed uh, for these crimes. Um, so this is one of the installations uh, for the show. The drawings, each one is uh, nine by, by 12 and is Conte on paper. And I use, I wanted to use uh, the Conte to evoke the police, the chalk lines that they used to do when there was a body, like somebody was killed on the street and there was a body. And um, and I wanted to also, you know, think of light you know, as life and, you know, black as dark as death. And also think of these women not as numbers because uh, that's most mostly the, the shock factor was used a lot in the media. Um, 
and actually, you know, have them think of them as, as women who were uh, similar, parallel, inspired by, or, is, you know, inspiring in uh, the, the same way that uh, women from history and mythology are. So this is actually titled Malinche. And Malinche is a historical figure from the Mexican uh, Spanish conquest. And you can see the, the ship on her shoulder and that the hair as you know she is kind of she was the translator uh, of Cortez so just thinking of these women as more than you know a number was very very important to me uh, this is from the same series is again flor de tierra flower of the earth and this was commissioned by the latino cultural center in dallas texas and it's acrylic cut paper acetate and again integrated with the architectural features of the lobby which was designed by uh, Legorreta, a uh, very uh, well-known architect. So again, I wanted to do something that honors the space, that, that integrates, it's very low impact. And uh, it was there during the run of a uh, play about the women of Juarez. The next one is a detail of that. So you can see more of the acetate and how you can see through and also some of the cutouts. And again, these scrolls are kind of floating, so they really uh, move when people walk by, they pass by, and just with any kind of a, you know, wind, they, they blow really beautifully. And now, you know, thinking of, of this uh, same disappearances, um, there's a case of uh, 43 students in Mexico who were disappear forcibly disappeared, basically kidnapped by the police. And, uh, uh, that month, that same, probably a week or two later, there was a demonstration here in, in Union Square. And uh, we were all, I was this road, I didn't know what to do. I, I know that there are a lot of demonstrations in New York, and I know that many people don't have the time or, the, you know, they don't pay attention, and especially something so specific and violent, I think it's hard for, for people to relate. So... I just improvised, like went to my studio, took a bunch of, uh, you know, rolls of paper and Sharpies and the subway started writing the names of the of the students who were disappeared. Uh, and when I got there, I asked people to help me finish writing the names and to pin them to my coat. And I walked around the demonstration like this. And I realized how much people engaged with me uh, asking me questions. So I had the opportunity to, to, to tell them to share what was happening. And it was just one more proof of how art, you know, can really create bridges and uh, create a dialogue. Uh, this is the same piece just uh, at that night. I, I, you know, I was walking there for probably four hours just around talking to people. Uh, and then the piece became more of a gallery piece. I, I created this and it's just uh, the names of the students written um, on vintage ribbons. And I show this in, in, in different uh, exhibitions. And I also actually brought this to the mothers of the disappeared. I've been in contact uh, with them and some of them uh, were actually here in New York. And uh, I presented this to them just very humbly. So that's you know one of the ways that you know, something that is public art becomes more of a gallery piece and vice versa. So again, going back to public art. So this is Art of Solidarity, Solidarity and it's a public art um, installation uh, commissioned by the Hispanic Society Museum in New York. And it was, uh, there was uh, probably 20 images printed and displayed on the terrace of the, of the museum. The museum was closed at the time. And uh, the project really has to do with uh, social justice issues. And uh, I do these uh, digital drawings and for display in galleries, for uh, publications here in the US and also in, in several parts of, uh, of Europe. And uh, I love doing these public art uh, exhibitions. This is another one. It was actually a three venue exhibition, a Hispanic Society Museum, the United Palace and the Maurice Schumel Mansion. And they were this in the, in the United Palaces. This is the facade. They were printed really large scale and displayed uh, there for a long time. And then this is Amal. Uh, this is another public art, uh, art project. Uh, she's a puppet and she travels around the world visiting different communities. 
So she came to visit uh, Washington Heights and I had the opportunity to be there. And it was just beautiful to see thousands of people interacting with their, the, with, the image, with the images, with her. It was just a very beautiful celebration. Um, and then we come to imagination. So this is uh, the collection of the images. Uh, it is a book that I uh, published last year and uh, just won the in the category of uh, best art book in the Latino International uh, Latino Awards. And uh, basically it's a series of images. They are square in format, they're uh, consistent, and they are all have to do with social justice issues. So human rights, uh, immigration, environment, displacement, war. So I'm gonna go through you know, a few of them or many, a lot of them maybe, um, just to give you a sense of what they are. So this is about human rights. This is titled Harmony. And um, again, these are published uh, locally in the Manhattan Times, but also in the nation, publications in Italy and in France. The, one of them has been uh, on the cover of uh, Le Monde and in France TV. So I, I love doing these digital works because I can you know, I can do them relatively fast and uh, usually I'm, I'm on deadline. And uh, also it makes it easier for me to uh, share with a just much bigger audience. It just goes internationally really quickly. Uh, this is titled The Real Cost of Borders, uh, just speaking about the wall and what it means uh, for migrants. Uh, this is titled Build Love, Not Walls. And uh, again, thinking of the family separations and immigrants, you know, people who leave their children or the parents in a different country. And, uh, and just the, you know, the links and the love is never broken. And uh, basically, you know, people will need, will do what they need to do in order to survive and feed their families. Um, this is titled Love Without Borders. Um, so again, all of these images kind of um, share very universal values, you know, love, peace, solidarity, uh, justice. And uh, it's a way of, for me to also um, process some of these things. Uh, I started this project probably seven years ago and, uh, you know, the, the rhetoric against immigration, against uh, Mexicans in particular, was very help, help hurtful. And uh, this actually helped me process some of that and also share, you know, my point of view as well. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm going backwards. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, this is titled The Immigrant, and it's kind of, I, I think of it almost as a self-portrait. It's bringing my Mexican culture and, and celebrating New York as well. I identify myself as a Mexican New Yorker. And, uh, you know, I adore New York and I adore my Mexican culture and, you know, it's, it's just both worlds are part of my life and what I navigate. Um, this is titled Women's Rights Are Human Rights. And this was awarded at the uh, uh, Biennial in, in Cuba. And again, just thinking of patriarchy and feminism and what it costs to you know, change things. Um, so very simple lines, very, very simple lines and messages that are you know, just immediate. That's kind of my goal. Um, this is titled Me Too, a Movement for Change. And this was awarded the first prize in the United Nations Award for Political Art. Um, so, I'm, you know, I, I've, I've shared many of these images and uh, for people to use as they please, either in public demonstrations, to you know, display them on their windows and to use them you know as they please I'm, I'm pretty uh open for uh you know for people to use them this is titled women's life at stake our bodies our choice and it's of course about um abortion and you know what was happening since a few years ago and i uh, couldn't believe that we are in this situation now but uh just thinking about how you know the impact of these decisions that are you know, they are, they're seen as political decisions, but they're really about human rights. Uh, this one is titled Pride is Intersectional. Again, thinking of uh, diversity in all aspects, even in activism. Um, uh, sometimes activism has a, a limited uh, range of uh, you know, participation or a perception. So I, I really always wanna um, underline that. 
Uh, again, equality is love. Just very simple lines, you know, simple and very uh, just clear messages. Uh, this is titled America's Love Affair with Guns, thinking of gun violence like every week, every month, there are you know, shootings around uh, the United States. It's something that I do not understand. I can't really comprehend. Uh, it really feels to me like it's a law affair with guns and um, uh, we have to stop it. I don't know how, but um, again, this is uh, about gun violence and it's titled Seeds of Peace. So many times I, I you know, I, I tackle these uh, subjects that are pretty heavy. Uh, but I want to do it in, in a way that is um, kind of gentle and that you know, focuses on humanity and tenderness rather than just, um, you know, depicting a problem or uh, pointing out something that is wrong. And this is titled Migration is Beautiful. Uh, again, just about the rhetoric of you know, anti-immigration and just thinking what it is, my grandma is just beautiful, it's going to happen, it's natural, and it's, it's just, uh, there's no way that we can stop it, and uh, we shouldn't. Uh, migrants come to the U.S. Uh, because they need to uh, feed their families, but also the U.S. benefits enormously from their con our contributions, both in the cultural life and uh, economics. So, uh, thinking of the environment and how you know, it impacts our life and how, you know, the tipping point is here in terms of climate change and global warming. So time is running out. And uh, the last few pieces, this is Imagine Peace. Uh, there's always a conflict around the world. There's always, you know, some place that, that that's at war. And sometimes it feels like it's far away, but it's it really, you know, it affects every one of us in the planet, and we need to understand that we are all connected. Um, this is one of my last pieces that I just made last week. It was published uh, this week in the Nation magazine. I'm just thinking of the humanitarian crisis that the war in the Middle East is generating. Um, you know, on top of everything else, so the, the, the humanitarian crisis is just unprecedented. And uh, it just, we just need to think about humanity in that sense, not just the politics and the countries. And again, this was published a couple of weeks ago, just when the, broke, the, the war broke out. And uh, it's uh, aspirational, right? <laughs> but uh, really thinking about what I can do when I'm you know, processing these things and also what I can do to share hope uh, I, you know, I call my art practice uh, really a practice of hope in action. So I think that was the last one. No, a few more, and then I'll, I'll go through this real quickly. So this is a wall. It was a flag design that was part of the flag project at Rockefeller Center Ring. It was uh, really exciting to see that human was flag flying at Rockefeller. This was. Uh, a commission for the Latin Grammy Awards and a cover for the New Yorker. And uh, I was honored as a hero, one of the heroes of the pandemic in Harlem. Um, this was uh, in San Nicolas and 120th Street. So again, doing work that is local, but also thinking globally is something that is very important to me. So I think that's the last one. Yes, well, some talks at the Brooklyn Museum and exhibitions. But I think that's that's about. I mean, it's pretty amazing work. Um, I'm, you mentioned like a few things that I want to discuss, like, um, you know, addressing a problem as a problem mm -hmm. and not looking at it. So I want to talk about that. But also just you were talking about what's going on like right now on it, in, in the Middle East, in, in Palestine, mm -hmm. in Israel, in the Gaza, in Israel. And I think you know, that's a good place to start only because it's like right now it's happening and it's in our faces, yes. you know, and the, and that's, I, I want to bring it back to the gaze because when we, <clears throat> there's been a lot of things happening just in Manhattan and in New York around New yes. York about, about what's happening right now. There's been, you know, multiple protests. Some of them are, you know, overtly pro-Israel, some are pro 
Palestine. Some are pro peace, right? Right. You know, yes. and 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 um, urging for a ceasefire and humanitarian corridors and whatnot. That's happening like all over the country, all over the world right now. Um, and I've I've been trying to. I mean, my my family is Jewish. Like my wife, and my kids are Jewish. Uh, my extended family, etc. And I have my own feelings about the occupation and about Israel. And I don't want to, I feel like it's a big topic that we can't really get into right now, but mm -hmm. I do think there is something in the terms of the gaze, the way we know about the, uh, about, about the situation there is through media, right? Like we have, we're not yes. there physically. So we're already, what we know about it or what we think we know about it is already channeled through a series of ideologies. In other words, there's a Middle East gaze, if you will, or an Israeli gaze, or yeah, absolutely, Israel, Israel Palestine gaze, etc. And I'm not sure Americans are capable of fully understanding the situation there. And that's my concern. Is you know, just the fact that Hamas has been so inextricably tied to the Palestinians. That they've almost become one thing in many people's minds who aren't necessarily following the situation that closely they don't know right. what hamas even is and they just allied the two that palestinians themselves are responsible for all this which is not the case right there are right. 2.2 million people in gaza who are completely innocent families many of them children in fact the median age in gaza is like 19 right which means, so, yes. To, yes, yes, which means that like yes. It would, and that means that like when, you know, Hamas was officially elected in 2006, and that means that half the population wasn't even in an age to vote for them at the time. And now they're, you know, living under the thumb of Hamas. So it's, I don't know if most Americans see that that's not in our gaze when we think about the Middle East and that's concerning to me. So, you know, and I'm looking, uh, relating it back to your work, you had the, you showed us the piece about called 43 Wings. And it was about mm -hmm. the 43 students who were disappeared and um, and murdered, right, and executed. I think this was 2013, 2014, when this happened, about a decade ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess my question would be is, in the realm of art and design, there's there's often a debate about the efficacy of activis activism. Like, how how helpful does making work, how, how helpful can it really be just working in a studio and making work and then getting it out there? um it's hard to judge and at what point do you believe that artists should transition from creating work in the studio to conducting direct action in the real world to bring about change i ask you in relation to 43 wings because you kind of did the opposite way you had a i think right you had a piece that yes. you were wearing right and yeah. it was like a it was a protest piece mm -hmm. that then later became you know high art in a gallery it's kind of, it's kind of like an interesting model for doing this. So I was thinking, I was hoping you could maybe discuss that a little bit. Like, where is the dividing line between these two things? And I, I mean, you, for what... me, there's no, yeah, there's no dividing line. Uh, this piece wasn't even an artwork in my mind when I went mm -hmm. to the demonstration. It was just a way of uh, acknowledging the names because th that number is just so shocking and the shock factor is really painful to, to watch how people just focus on the number. And I understand it because it's just that shocking. Uh, but I really wanted to acknowledge the names. And uh, I, I had no agenda, really. I had no idea what was gonna, it was going to look like. In fact, I didn't even look at it until somebody showed me a picture. Um, so it was my way of participating in something uh, like more, not as an audience, but as a participant. So I, you know, it, it was a revelation to me, like that that afternoon, that evening was a revelation to me of how, you know, I knew this in my mind, but I had never experienced it so directly, so clearly, how people approached me and asked the questions and the difficult questions, and they were, you know, willing to listen. And I really saw how instead of focusing on the brutality of the case and the number, they were focusing more on the humanity, on tenderness, or on how these kids were, you know, just students. And th that was incredibly uh, powerful, like just, you know, uh, that turning point in my life as an artist. 
I've always been an activist. So, and I, I, I've done activist always related to, to art. Um, I, I think, you know, it's my way of communicating. It's just my language. That's one thing. Uh, I need to be participating in these uh, just uh, actions because I cannot just stand or, you know, be inside my studio and just be in my head. It's just too painful. So it's my way of, you know, connecting with people. And uh, I think it's definitely an individual decision. So I, I don't think a decision. I don't think artists need to do anything they don't want to do. I think it's just really an individual, just personal decision. Uh, for me, this this works for me in terms of how I process things. It works because I can connect with people. You know, I'm a freelance artist. I'm in the studio 24 hours a day. I you know don't connect with a lot of people. Uh, live all the time so uh, this is my way of connecting and uh, but it's, it's definitely an individual decision I, I don't think artists need to do you know political work it's, it's just uh, yeah. yeah so on this the subject of the gays I mean in particular with these students I think like Americans have a migrant gaze right like we it's portrayed or represented as a problem the language is used is all problematic, right? That it's a surge or an influx. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the numbers are so big and, you know, there's, uh, you know, millions of, of undocumented people. This is like the most generous language, right? That we don't know where they are, right? That's like always kind of portrayed as, it, it's similar to the, to the language that be, would be used to describe like a disease, frankly. Right, mm. something we can't see, but we know it's there, and it, it's it's probably responsible for all kinds of problems, right? And I think that's, and it's it's all over the news. I mean, that's how it's talked about. That that fuels the discussion, and that language underlies the discussion. Not not imagery of of migrants that is helpful. The imagery is they're in hordes, they're dirty, they're you know carrying drugs, like you know they're or they're carrying something that you know, it's it's alluded to as being drugs, et cetera, right? So, um, yeah, I think so you, that's, yeah. that's another thing, just, yeah, that I I really, you know, it's super important to me is to um, change the perception that yeah. immigrants, uh, brown people, brown, black people in general, uh, do not experience or have the right to joy and to rest yeah. yeah so that's one of the reasons why my work is so i don't know uplifting i would say so hopeful because i i do not want to portray us as always struggling even though that might be true most of the time for many people uh, but the struggle is not sustainable if there's no joy i know for a fact that you know art has been instrumental in in survival of you know many communities that are oppressed and joy is a right and is it's a uh, beauty it's uh, it, it's revolutionary joy and beauty are revolutionary so i think of this as celebrations rather than as you know the portrayal of a problem i think it's very very important to to know that i i have a a follow-up to that then the the i think the gay is when we talk about the gay is it, it implies a kind of detachment right from mm -hmm. the, what it is we're yes. looking at that's one of the issue the central issues of the gays right where right. um where we we view social issues in this case from a distance and that is on the news that's in the media that's in art potentially in design but how can young artists and designers avoid this tendency to create distance and create work that really engages with the lived experiences of those affected by the issues? I would say focus on, you know what I do? I focus on tenderness. Mm. I really I really try to focus on, on, on tenderness and, and that really brings down a lot of walls, uh, even with subjects that are super heavy. Just focus on, on, on the humanity of that. And, uh, you know, tenderness just, you know, brings down your perceptions your, your prejudices um and focus on beauty really focus on beauty because there's beauty everywhere and even the struggle has beauty as i said it's part of survival so 
you know, focus on that. And really, for me, I, I really believe that, that art can change the world. And I do know that changing, you know, one person's heart will change uh, the world because it, it has an impact and it creates a uh, hope and it creates action. And, uh, and it's also an invitation to dialogue, you know, even yeah. when people yeah. are, yeah, if, if they don't like it, if they don't agree with what I'm, you know, saying, uh, it's, uh, we need to talk about these things and uh, dialogue is very, very important. You know, another thing that strikes me is that women and artists of color, um, non-binary artists, they, they've mm -hmm. historically faced pretty unique challenges in the art world um, mm -hmm. that I haven't. For example, someone like me has not. How do you see the experiences and impact of artists from marginalized groups differing from those of cisgender white males like myself when it comes to engaging in arts activism? Or activism of any kind, really. Right. How is it different? So, like, you know. Uh, I think for us it's survival. You know, it's action is, 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 is you know, non-action is not an option. It's, uh, you know, somebody was describing uh, my book as, you know, he mentioned something about a uh, rage, like righteous rage that I had. And I had to explain I have no rage. I really don't. I, I don't have time. I cannot. I, I don't have the luxury of rage. It will destroy me. So I have indignation, right? But anger and rage are, are things that are, you know, we have very limited space for those because it will be too destructive. So we need to focus on action and on change. So I think that's the difference. Uh, I think sometimes uh, people who are not part of the vulnerable communities get almost um almost excited about participating in this uh, you know demonstrations or you know activities and uh, it's it's not for us it's not an adventure it's not an option it, it's just what we need to do so i think yeah. that's a little bit of the difference even though yeah. you know, it comes from solidarity uh, and from a place of you know just uh, good intention um i think we always yeah. have to focus on both the meeting of intention and impact is just like the super important. Yeah. Um, I, you know, another thing is that I feel like art, especially your art, which you've sort of distilled pretty complex stuff, complex social issues into like a theme or one central idea, right? Um, in this case, it could be tenderness, love, you know, you, you, you said it yourself, you like, tend to gravitate towards these inspiring things. And that's sort of the focus. And, and that, that, that translates across language barriers um, in ways that like words can't, like language can't do that. Um, and that's just the one of the great things about art and design, right? So given the global reach of your work and, and the work of artists around the world, how can young artists, like the students at Lehman, for example, responsibly engage with these international social political issues um, without inadvertently imposing their perspectives or their values on other cultures. I, I, I say this like sort of bringing it back to what's happening in Gaza and, right. and what happened in Israel, because again, this is just one thing it's in the news right now, it's happening now and it's, we're, 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 it's in our faces. Um, how, can, how can we responsibly and, and respectfully respond to something like that going forward? So I, I think that the main thing to do is listening is first. Just be open mm -hmm. to listening without, mm -hmm. you know, imposing your point of view, even if it's you know, an idea, just listening first. Yeah. Uh, we also talk a lot about this, um, um, you know, anything about us without us is not for us. So we have to listen, we have to be humble, all of us. Uh, and then take guidance from the people who know best. You know, people who are in the struggle know best. The same way that, you know, when you go to the doctor and you, you, you know your body, you know best. Um, so I, I think listening first, and then, you know, going, thinking of compassion. 
you know, what's your motivation? Like, what do you want to do? You want to show your world, you want to display your world, you want to help, you want to change the world. What is it that you want to do? Uh, and, you know, you can also just listen. Listening is actually activism if it's not in a mindful way. Um, so I think that I will say just, you know, listening first and then just thinking about compassion. Yeah, listening is... Um... It's a really hard skill to learn to listen to people and to allow for silence. This is the thing that like therapists do really well. They don't yeah. say anything and that yeah. forces people to divulge perhaps more than they were willing to mm -hmm. at the time. Um, so I, at least from the therapist perspective, therapy perspective, I can, I can attest to that. Um, yes. uh, at any rate, thank you so much uh, for meeting with us today. Um, I, I, I just want to thank you because like, like I had said in my intro, I was thinking back uh, to first coming across the nation. We're talking like 2003, 2004, right? And um, it's sort of, that's sort of where the activism in my life sort of started when I got, I started educating myself, um, mm -hmm. reading a lot of stuff. And I remember seeing your work through the, you know, the, this, all this period. And it's kind of, it's, and it didn't really occur to me until after we met. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I recognize all this work. And I look back at some of, of like the issues in the nation and it kind of struck me. So it's kind of, it's, a, it's an honor to, to meet with you and speak with you and look at your work and talk about, you know, like lifting the hood off, off of what you've been working on. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and uh, I really look forward to seeing what comes next from your Thank uh, you studio. so much. It was a pleasure talking with you. And uh, yes, come uh, see my show. My next uh, installation is going to be at Flatiron Plaza November 1st. Okay. So yeah, I'll send you some info. But uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, it was an honor and a pleasure. All right. Thank you, everybody. And we'll see everybody next week. All right. Thank you so much. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.